Today's episode of Socially Democratic is presented to you by Dunn Street. Dunn Street is a campaign agency that specialises in community organising. We only work with people that want to build power to make the world a better place, including community-based organisations, trade unions, progressive businesses and social democratic parties across the globe. We develop community engagement strategies to win campaigns both big and small, and we train engagement staff and volunteers in the Gantt's framework of leadership, organising and action. And we also help Folks craft their story through the practice of public narrative that connects people through their shared values and moves them to act together. And if you want to create change in your community, then hit us up at dunstreet.com.au. Today's episode is also brought to you by Morris Blackburn Lawyers. As Australia's number one plaintiff law firm, Morris Blackburn believe the law should serve everyone and not just those who can afford it. Morris Blackburn have helped influence some of Australia's most important legal decisions, including equal pay for women and Indigenous workers, and helped over 500,000 Australians get the compensation they deserve. Morris Blackburn Lawyer's experience you can count on. Hello and welcome to another episode of Socially Democratic, your weekly centre-left politics and organising podcast out every Friday that dives into the progressive campaigns of the day and the people leading them from um, from home and abroad. Apologies, we didn't get our episode uh, with David Feeney, our Hour of Power episode out last Friday. We had uh, a couple of challenges uh, at our end, and obviously this episode is dropping a little bit later today as well. Um, we always try to endeavour to get the thing out uh, first thing Friday morning, but we've just had a couple of um, uh, logistical challenges we need to overcome. But so we appreciate your patience. Uh, today's episode is our annual budget preview. So we're going to be joined on, on the line by Emma Dawson from Per Capita and Ed uh, Kavanagh from the McCall Institute to preview the federal budget that's going to be handed down next Tuesday evening. So looking forward to that conversation with those two fine individuals. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to the show. And be sure to give us five stars on uh, Apple Podcast when you're done listening to today's episode and give us a review. And uh, show the sorry support the show by joining us on uh, Socially Democratic Patreon, uh, where you can access all show updates, new merchandise, and more. We're going to be launching that in a couple of weeks' time, so look out for that. And for everything else, follow Dunn Street on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Okay, let's get to today's episode. Okay, we're taping this one on a Monday afternoon on the lands of the Wurundjeri people. Uh, It's budget season. Uh, So we're heading into very uncharted mental territories for Stephen Donnelly here. Um, And that's why I've relied on some experts. I literally feel like it's the the political version of a Bill Simmons podcast when he talks about, uh, he gets like um, pop culture experts on and he'll just try and work in as many sporting analogies as he possibly can. Uh, I think I'll try and work in as many campaign analogies into (laughs) this particular topic, but it's a very, very popular episode. I think it's our third year running. So we're, we're, um, bringing in the heavyweights to help us prepare for the budget. So we're going to do a preview. Obviously, this is a preview episode, and then we'll do a review episode with the same folks next week. So I'm joined on the line by the executive D- director of Per Capita, uh, Emma Dawson. Great to see you again, Emma. Hey, Stephen. Good to be with you again. Fantastic. And uh, from the CEO of Macal Institute, uh, Ed Kavanagh, who's been on the show, but not with me, because I think you did an episode while I was gallivanting around the world on annual leave. Ed, great to see you. Uh, good to see you and thanks for having me and uh, excuse any uh, slowness on my part. I'm just off the plane from Dublin, um, so I got back last night. So if I'm jet lagged, uh, please excuse me. Oh, you should have told me that. See, now I could <laughs> literally do a whole podcast on you know, best pints in Dublin that you had. What did you get up to? This could be a travel podcast. We'll, oh, we'll do the next one. Yeah, we'll that sounds do the good. next time. Okay, great. No, but quickly, best pint. Where was the best pint you had in Dublin? What pub? Oh, I wish I knew the name. I mean, I went to about 40. Uh, uh, but what, what I will say is I'm, I'm shocked at how different they really were. You know, you go from one to the other and it was like a night and day. So uh, I should have been writing down the names of them, but uh, we'll do that by the next one. And it can be fighting words as well amongst Dubliners if you say yeah. that's the best pint versus someone else and then they'll, you know, you'll get into a massive argument. So it's best right. to be the sort of agnostic Antipodean and not weigh into those debates, but Keo's, I'm told, from Labor Party people is the best. Yeah. Part in okay. There you go. I'll know that for next time. <laughs> Good stuff. Okay, let's get into it. So it's the third budget for the Albanese government. Uh, and before we sort of look towards this particular upcoming budget, I kind of want to get both of your perspectives on where the Australian economy stands as it is. And if you want to draw back on some of the things that were in the last budget um, and how that has put the 
like you know where is the budget right now going into this new one or certainly the things that have happened in, since the last budget I'm keen to get your reflections on that as well but sort of where is it performing well where are there areas of concern that needs to be addressed so let's sort of set the scene and I'll go to you Emma first where, where do you think the Australian economy stands as it is right now heading into this particular budget season? Um, it's it's performing better than a lot of economies overseas um, but the, the problems are structural in our economy and they've been there for a long time. And what we're seeing, of course, is what always happens when Labor comes to power federally is they come into power when everything and all the shits just hit the fan and they have to try and clean it up. Um, so I think what we've seen in the first um, couple of years of this government is very um, steady management of the economy, very um, what would be really lauded uh, if it was under a Liberal government by the by the, the Murdoch press, right? We've had a surplus, we're on track for another one. Um, those things were incredibly important to the right-wing media for a long time. Suddenly they don't seem to be anymore, which is interesting. I'm, you know, surpluses, federal surpluses are fetishised in this country and they shouldn't be, but if you... If there is ever a time to maintain a surplus, it's when we've got an inflation problem like the one we've got now and that we've been living in for the last two years. So you've got to give Jim Chalmers a lot of credit, actually, for keeping a very... T- and Katie Gallagher too, of course, she's in the Dr No position in the finance ministry, um, for keeping a really firm hand on the spending requests from their cabinet colleagues because they are huge. You know, there's a... after after 12, you know, a, a, nearly a decade of really poor mismanagement of the economy, even through a crisis, um, when the previous government did spend money, they spent it in all the wrong places, you know, and, that, and that's no doubt contributed to the inflation problem we've got now. So while there will be calls on, and there are calls on social media, this is meant to be a Labor government, why are they doing, running a surplus when they could be spending it and helping people? Um, you splash too much of that money out back into an overheated economy, you make it worse for a lot of people. So I think the first thing I want to say is well done on on holding the line, on maintaining some, you know, budget um, integrity and discipline. But, and it's a big but, and the Treasurer said this himself, um, these surpluses are transitory, the budget is in long-term structural deficit, and in order to do the things that people elect Labor governments to do, we are going to have to invest more in the economy and that means we're going to have to shift the tax and transfer mix quite significantly over coming years. The challenge of genuine tax reform, genuine economic reform is only going to get more pressing as time goes on. Um, So this is a pre-election budget. I don't expect to see a lot of tax reform in this budget Um, but I hope it will set the stage for... Uh, a, you know, a, a, a sensible conversation nationally with the crossbench as well um, about what we need to do in the years ahead to ensure we've got the resources to fund the services that we need and to fund a more equal society for people, um, housing, mm. job opportunities in the new economy. All those things take investment and it needs the government to lead that investment. Ed, do you want to build on uh, some of those reflections from, from Emma about where we are right now? Yeah, for sure. And I agree agree with with all of that. I think, you know, I was thinking about this, you know, look back, what, two years ago, two and a half years ago, uh, whenever it was when, um, or yeah, it's basically straight on two years now that they they, they took power. Um, And if you looked at the sort of state of the economy now from from then, you'd be pretty pretty happy. You know, when Labor took office, we had inflation running at 7.8% or whatever it was, uh, wage growth at two and a half or so, like this real, real challenge. Now, you know, inflation is still a, a little bit too high. You know, the mean trimmed inflation is 4% or whatever it is. Um, but we have seen a return to real, uh, real wages growth, which is really positive. A couple of budget surpluses. You know, these are good. Uh, th- this is a pretty good situation. We've still got a very strong labour market. You know, there's a lot of uh, a lot of things to celebrate there. Um, we're also sort of in this moment where I think, you know, this is still kind of a cost of living um uh, budget. We're in this, you know, still in the midst of the cost of living crisis, but it feels like the sort of emergency moment of the cost of living uh, question has sort of moved on a little bit in the sense that there, there, there seems to be less um, talk about, I guess, uh, you know, kind of emergency support measures re- regarding cost of living and more what, what Jim Chalmers called, you know, relief and reform, figuring out a way to that the spending that they do do has some sort of medium, longer term structural um, you know, benefit whether maybe not for the budget necessarily, but for various sort of social and economic yields. So, 
I think they're going into this budget in a in a strong position. I think, you know, recently we've seen the, 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 they did want inflation to come down lower. We had a lot of conversation around there was going to be interest rate cuts later in this year. That sort of moved on. So that probably changes a little bit of the political calculus over the next six or nine months or so. Um, but generally speaking, I think, look, we're in a strong position. There are still these sort of, you know, despite the good news, there are a lot of people in the country that are certainly doing it very, very difficult. Um, we're having this problem with, you know, people even in the labour market, um, you know, really struggling to get by. And I think part of the balancing act in this budget is not just um, providing the right support for people, but also genuinely empathising about the plight that a lot of people have in the country and not being too triumphalist about the good news. You know, we've seen particularly in the US, I think, too much triumphalism from the Biden administration about how good and how strong the economy is, even though that headline data might be something to support and celebrate. You need to sort of pay genuine uh, respect and, and empathy towards the, the challenges that people are facing. So that's kind of what I'm going to be looking at the next few days. Excellent uh, opening salvo. So I just want to, I do want to talk about the surplus in a moment, but I, before we do that, I just want to get a sense from both of you about um, the state's tax cut announcements that were made a while back. How significant is that in changing the goal, <laughs> changing the goalposts? Uh, mm. for this year's budget like if that didn't happen what would we would Jim Chalmers be in a different sort of position heading into this into this budget um Emma oh, to you first for sure and you know you know I was banging on about these tax cuts from the day they were announced by Morrison when he was treasurer um mm. and scrapping them was never going to be politically feasible what Chalmers came down with in the end was really good um, really good redesign of those tax cuts um, to ensure that they actually did return bracket creep to middle income earners effectively, um, and they do that now. You know, they, they uh, if they had gone into this budget with those tax cuts as they were, eight thousand dollars for someone on two hundred grand, nothing for someone on fifty, and let's remember, stage one and two has largely been repealed because they were temporary offsets rather than permanent cuts. Yeah he would have been facing a real problem um, of having to pump a lot more money into households through direct spending than taxing in order to manage the in inequity of that. People see them come in on the 1st of July, there would have been real pain and real anger about that. Um, and doing it through a tax cut is less inflationary, actually, than just giving people a one-off payment or you know, um, or a, a increasing, um, you know, direct benefits to households. Uh, energy, the energy bill um, relief has been done very cleverly. That's really not inflationary at all. Um, but the tax cuts, the change of the tax cuts was essential. Um, I think it, uh, it took too long to get there, but we got there because the community attitude had shifted, right? And that goes to all of the people that joined per capita eventually in the campaign to, to change them. Um, when it became obvious that the, that the electorate understood what was going on and just how few people were going to benefit and the cost of living pressure on people, then the momentum for change became irresistible and that's when we saw them act. And But I think, you know, you have to give credit to the Treasurer's Office in particular here who never gave up on that, who always made the argument that that we needed to be, you know, that they were inherently regressive the way they were um, and that they needed to be reformed. Having said that, they're not tax reform, right? They're just tax cuts. Mm -hmm. And effectively, if we had indexed tax brackets, um, these kinds of cuts wouldn't be announced every few years because we just have an indexation that made sure that our tax system kept up with, with bracket creep. Important thing to do. Thank you for doing it. Um, it's finally allowed me to be able to move on and look at other issues. Um, but... And I, th but I think what it does show is um, that when when you're at, you're willing to do something that's what people expect of a Labor government of being fairer, then they'll accept that happily. You know, there was very little. It was done cleverly as well. You know, it was very hard for the opposition to oppose it. Susan Lee gave it her best go, but it really didn't work. Yeah, they, um, were, they were scrambling. <laughs> yeah. So I hope it sets. I hope what it does is give some sense to those in caucus and cabinet that are more nervous about bolder tax reform. That if you bring people with you and explain why you're doing it and demonstrate that it's better for the most people and better for the country, it can be done. So um, kudos, thank God you did it. Um, thank you for doing it. Uh, but I hope it's just the first step towards some real bold tax reform in a in a next term of uh, an Albanese government. 
It's an interesting yeah. point you raised there. I want to go to you, Ed. The boldness of this government, um, they seemed very hesitant to make this announcement for a very, very long time. Um, what's your thoughts about the – I don't want to use the word courage, but um, just the way that they're behaving in this, this sort of this certainty or uncertainty about decisions they want to make in this space. Well, with stage three, you know, <laughs> there was certainly a lot of pressure for them to change and no absolute kudos for everyone doing that, including yourself, Emma. Like it was, it was absolutely necessary to put that pressure on. I think um, when they ended up announcing it, it, it made sense. You know, they had this really challenging end to, the, to last year. They went into this year. They really changed the narrative and did kind of catch the opposition on the, flat, on the, on the back foot, didn't really know how to argue against it. But what it has done, and exactly like Emma was saying, you know, this is the really the marquee cost of living feature of the of the budget that people will feel, um, and it is sizable enough for people earning you know above a median income or around a median income to really actually feel the difference in a monthly, weekly, fortnightly paycheck, whatever it is. So it 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 limited the pressure on them to to do all these other sort of cash splashes that you might otherwise see in this moment. So, um, and I think it still is a you know a relatively brave choice. They had to, you know overtly abandon and discard a, a, a promise um, and they the way that they did that was not just by uh, you know doing it recklessly they came up with something better and that made it impossible to argue against so it was a you know I think I think it was a it was overdue I'm extremely glad it happened but the way they they, they went about it was was very clever and it's given them breathing room I think going into this budget can we talk about uh, the the I guess the sort of I think this is the central question about this budget. Uh, we yeah. touched on it last week on the episode of the Feeney Files with uh, David Feeney and Rebecca Thistleton actually from Macau, uh your colleague Ed, uh, joined us. We talked about the sort of goal of this budget. Does the Treasurer keep spending um, down in the hopes that the RBA drops the interest rates before the election or do they use some of this surplus to spend um, to support where the voters are struggling uh, with the cost of living? Uh, but then that puts pressure on. It could be seen as inflationary, um, which would then mean the RBA will just not touch interest interest rates. Mm. Sticking with you, Ed, what are your thoughts on what what, what Jim Chalmers does here? Yeah, I, I think that we'll be uh, trying to thread the needle with a you know a modest surplus. I think um, I, I'm not sure what what that will look like, what the extent of that will be. Um, uh, but, you know, I, I think as, as I was saying, you know, the stage three changes is really a sort of marquee um, in, uh, cost of living measure. There's huge amounts of other areas of budgetary pressure in the longer term, NDIS, you know, AUKUS, all these sort of other big spending commitments that are, uh, are kind of lurking. Um, uh, but they're going into an election year. Um, they want to demonstrate this consistent economic responsibility and management and you have to excuse me there's a street sweeper out the uh, side of my house as uh, always is the uh, the case when you're doing a podcast um but so i think they'll still be pursuing the approach that they have had in the last couple of budgets and they want to make the argument that you know they've the thread of the needle between sensible economic management and genuinely addressing cost of living pressures i don't think that's going to change here and i don't think you're going to expect to see some sort of uh, huge additional new spending commitments beyond what has already been signalled. Emma, I'm just trying to think of the um, calendar here right now. This may actually be the last budget before the next they, election. I think Albanese flagged when he was last asked about this, you know, he intends to go full term, but there may be a mini budget in March or April next year. But, yeah, this is the full, this is the last likely full, you know, regular May budget. Um but of course, there's my EFO in October, November, and they may, they almost certainly will do a mini budget if they're going to go to the polls twelve months from now. I would think, um, but yeah, it's critically important in terms of setting up. You know, what have we achieved? I, I think traditionally you'd say third budget, second second real budget. The first was a sort of mini, just after coming to office budget. But what have we done? This is the this is the tenor of this Labor government, and what are we going to do next? And that's the context in which it's being handed down. Um, but, and it's a big but, no first-term Labor government has picked up, no first-term government in Australia has picked up seats at its second mm. election in 100 years. We, uh, Labor only has a margin of two seats. So they're very much heading into um, the election with 
a lot of weight in those bags in terms of are we going to hold on to the four seats we picked up in WA? Likely not. Are we going to pick up any seats in Queensland? We'll need to if we're going to lose some in WA. Redistributions that make it unclear whether a seat or two might go in Victoria and New South Wales. And then you've got the Greens coming really hard at some of those inner city seats. So there is, um, I think there's a great column in today's nine papers by Sean Kelly, my friend Sean, who used to work um, in the Rudd and Gillard governments, and where he talks about this, the question that you originally put, this has been a, a cautious, fairly steady government so far. And I think at some point that becomes difficult for them when they're heading into an election where they actually need to almost treat it like they're coming from opposition if they're going to pick up seats and maintain a majority, then people need to be given a reason to vote Labor, not just not to vote for the opposition. And some of the things we're seeing, like um, the changes to Hex uh, indexation that was announced today, for example, they're good, they're sensible moves, but they're going to be told they're not enough by a lot of those the pressure that's coming from the left. Um, so I think it's it's a particularly challenging environment going into an election year for a government that doesn't have a huge majority and wants to say, look at the good things we've done, and they have done a lot of good things. They've done a lot of good things that don't get nearly enough credit. Um, and from those people um, in the welfare lobby, for example, who just say they're as bad as the other lot, well, Ask, tell that to any single mum who's, you know, reliant on welfare and now has single parenting payment till their child's 14. Um, to people in this, we've seen more spending on social housing than we have in the last 30 years. So, but enough is going to be the is going to be the cry from the left. And yet, from the right, you've already got the Murdoch papers going. They can't spend. They can't intervene in the economy this way. They're spending too much. So your question is really pertinent, if they were to keep spending, um, they, they've exhausted just about every option they've got for spending to um, to give some households some relief without it becoming inflationary at this point, right? They've, they've had a, there's been a 35% increase to the base rate of um, income support over the last four years. If you include, you know, um, uh, the previous government's changes as well, they've been um, direct investment in how in energy relief for housing, the tax cuts are there. If they were to come out now with a huge package of of household relief in some way, and it's hard to see other than those mechanisms what's left, then you would be almost certainly putting um, the pressure on inflation that would mean you would not see that rate cut before the next election. And 60% of people in this country either own their home outright or are paying a mortgage. They don't necessarily want to see, you know, that that is that is important relief for the 33% of people with a mortgage. Um, if you were to say, well, we'll give more money to Commonwealth rent assistance, for example, that's probably going to put, just push rents up and be inflationary on on the likelihood of further interest rate cuts. So it is a really tricky balancing act. And I think those people that are saying more, 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 more at this stage in the electoral cycle need to understand um, that making sure the economy doesn't blow up one way or the other, doesn't, you know, we don't see inflation massively go up and interest rates start rising again, um, or that we see wages to start, start falling in unemployment going up, um, both bad outcomes uh, for, the, for the for the community as well as for the current government. And um, can I, can you get your thoughts on that from as a, the budget as a political document? Because as Emma outlines, there you know there electorally, it's a very fine line for Labor in this ne next election. And so you would think normally this budget would be a budget that would be like here are the target demographics or audiences in these specific seats that we need to win and woo <laughs> to ensure that they vote for the Labor Party. Um, how are they going to manage to do that whilst not putting, you know, ha having creating, uh, you know, inflationary pressure or fucking up the economy or just shit public policy? Like, Because right now we should be actually just having a budget that says to, to middle-class voters, we got you and we need you to vote for us in the next election. Yeah. Well, we talked about stage three, but one of the, the geniuses of that is they can literally go to every single person in the country who has a job and say, here's something directly, tangibly for, for you personally. And people will feel that. So that creates a whole bunch of space 
to to you know not have uh, basically alleviates pressure in other ways where, which you might otherwise feel. Uh, you know, when 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 Labor took office, you have to you know there was still this sort of reputational challenge for Labor governments federally around economic management around. You know, can are they going to you know, um, you know, go crazy and spend too much, do this and that, and you know, part of the challenge for, for them from day one has been to demonstrate their credentials to, you know, mainstream uh, uh, Australia that they they know what they're doing, and I th- still think that's core to their their pitch for re-election. It's you know, when we when we contrast their approach to governing to what the opposition are proposing at the moment, the radicals. Are the opposition like they literally have two core policies? Uh, one around nuclear energy and super for housing. Like that's like their two biggest policies. These are radical, expensive, um, uh, kind of often unpopular ideas that are controversial and you know sort of somewhat reckless. So there, there's there's space there just in middle Australia for the Labor government to yes alleviate legitimate cost of living pressures, but also demonstrate. You know, we are actually the adults in the room and reset some of that narrative for the for the medium term. And I think that, you know, that's not as sexy sometimes as doing some other things here and there, but that's pretty sound politics if you're trying to set up a government um, for the long term. I want to talk about priorities. And uh, if I can start with you, Emma, what do you think that we sort of we fit around the edges here, but let's get straight into it. What do you think some are the key priorities with your per capita hat on that should be in this in this budget? Um, and then I'll get Ed to jump in on some of those from a Macau perspective, and then we can maybe sort of just move through some of those things collectively. But starting with you, can you set the scene? What do you think some of those key priorities are for the budget? Uh, so obviously we've seen announcements over the weekend and today on on changing indexation for HEX, but also some um, uh, bursaries or stipends to students completing uh, degrees in nursing, teaching, social work, midwifery, something we've been fighting really hard for. Very happy to see that. And that points to, I think, this is going to be the first iteration of Jason Clare's response to the university's accord. Um, I think education and opportunity for young people is going to be a really important theme in this budget because really when you look at what's happening on on the pressure that's coming from the left and this whole issue of generational inequality, what we're talking about is the loss of social mobility and the loss of opportunity and the feeling amongst a generation of people in this country that no matter what they do, they can't build as good a life as their parents did. I think that that will be a strong theme in this budget and if it isn't, it should be and it should be the entire theme for the next election. Um, So I think that spending in the education space is good. Um, The Minister said this morning that's not all they're going to do, but I think it's an important first indication. And I think then that theme needs to go more broadly to look at what, you know, what is the next economy? What are we setting up for the next generation of Australians? And the Future Made in Australia um, idea goes to that. Uh, We haven't seen a lot of detail, policy detail on that front yet, but we are seeing it pull in a lot of the vehicles, investment vehicles and things that the government has already set up, like the National Reconstruction Fund, the Rewiring Australia, the Clean Energy Finance Corporation's new remits and so on. And what that is, uh, for all that the Judith Sloans of the world are having conniptions over protectionism, um, is really just a very sensible and long overdue recognition that the government needs to shape the next economy, that this is the biggest disruption to our economy, probably since the Industrial Revolution, Uh, more so, I I would say, than the internet and and computing revolution, because that was largely positive in terms of productivity. There are risks as well as opportunities here. So I think that this budget has to be and will be very much focused on what's the purpose of government in playing a role in building the economy of the future. Because as we decarbonise, a lot of what this country has relied upon for its prosperity will no longer be viable. Um, You know, a lot of those fossil fuel exports will decline whether whether people want them to or not, and I certainly do. Um, And so I think this budget will be very much about saying how what is the role of government in establishing the framework by which people can build a good life? Not not a handout government as such. but removing a lot of the barriers that we've put in place of young people, um, addressing those those 
fears that people have that not only will there not be a healthy planet to live on, but I won't have a decent job in it and I won't be able to afford a home. And so this, I think this budget has to be very much about how we are helping you to thrive, how we are continuing the great labour tradition of taking moments of great disruption, whether that was the Second World War or the um, challenges of the um, economic crisis of the 1970s, and recreating an economy that is fit for the times. And that's what I see Chalmers talking about very much. Um, he's re being relentlessly compared to his mentor, Paul Keating, at the moment, um, often unfavourably by the white right wing hmm. press. I think that's deeply unfair because what Chalmers has is a grasp of the current challenges and of our place in those challenges in the world. Um, and so this, this is a really important budget in setting that up. Um, I think the first couple of budgets were rightly focused on people that have been very badly left behind and trying to bring them, you know, back into society to some extent. There's still more to do there, definitely. I'm not suggesting that the rate of job seeker is in any way adequate, but this budget will be very much about um, building the platform for investment in what comes next and how we can grow in a way that's sustainable and brings the community with it. Restoring hope to people is what it needs to be about. Very good. Uh, I'm gonna, there's a whole bunch of things I want to come back to you about that, Emma, in a moment, but I also want to hear from Ed. Eddie, you think, with your um, Macal cap on, what do you think the priorities of this budget need to be? So just just drawing on some of the threads there that, um, that Emma was mentioning, I think, and look, I actually don't know what precisely this would look like, but one of the things that you're going to hear more criticism of in terms of the state of the economy generally over the next little while is the productivity problem. Um, we do have a kind of relatively... Uh, you know, relatively uh, alarming productivity numbers uh, inherent in the economy at the moment. I'm just curious about how they're going, going to address that or what they say about that or if there's new measures or something to to address that um, that legitimate problem because, yeah, you know, there's every time we talk about the sort of general positive state of the economy, there's always this, you know, I think reasonable asterisks around it, but, you know, we do have productivity issues, et cetera. So that'll be interesting to see. Um I, I, I still think there is more that the government needs to um, pursue in in housing. Um, not that there hasn't been a huge amount already done and said, and there's been the half and other big, you know, significant commitments in, in previous um, previous budgets. These, these are all good things. Um, but you know, I, I worry about the conversation and the argument kind of being lost. Um, despite all uh, Labor governments having all of the levers at their disposal around the country to do some really significant things, particularly on social housing. There has been, you know, a great deal of a additional investment over the past few years uh, into the social housing sector. I just still think there's much more room to, to do it and and do it proudly, you know. Um, we have a Prime Minister that uh, grew up in social housing. We want to... We, we, there's still a sense and a, and a caution, maybe not so much within... You know, I'm not speaking personally about anyone in within the Labor government, but just in generally in society, in some some circles, you meet. You know, they don't really want to see money allocated towards social housing as much as it should be because pot potentially it looks like you're giving something away to people that shouldn't be, etc. We need to see more of a focus towards key worker housing as well. I think that's a serious space that we're just not um, really talking about in any meaningful way yet. In terms of you know, we haven't actually seen much policy on that so far. So I think. I think there's still territory for Labor to come out and be a bit more aggressive and a bit more ambitious on social housing, key worker housing, that sort of space. That's what I'd love to see a lot more of. Um, we did a budget submission a few months ago and it was sort of filled with, you know, little bits and pieces ideas, things that weren't going to be too expensive. One of the ones that I've always liked that we've we've pursued for quite a few years at Mikel is this idea of social emergency lending, basically trying to use the government uh, uh, balance sheet to uh, crush payday lenders, which I think it is this social ill. You know, that's a, they're, they're a really um, sort of uh, at times nefarious actors. And a lot of lower income Australians often depend on payday lenders just to, you know, their washing machine breaks down and they go to them and they get stuck in debt spirals. I think there's a way to address that particular problem. That's a kind of small idea. That's a personal <laughs> um, policy that I like. I'd, I'd like to see something in that in that regard as well. Um, but yeah, those bigger questions around productivity and around seriously trying to win this housing argument, uh, I think I think I'll be interested to see wh where there's more in those spaces. So 
pardon my ignorance, Ed, I didn't realise that they that productivity was an issue in this country. I have always assumed since, you know, we changed the way that industrial relations worked in this country, part of the reason why we went into bargaining at an enterprise was to increase productivity. Where and Where is productivity not doing its heavy lifting in the Australian economy? Tell me like I'm a three-year-old. The, the productivity <laughs> number. Well, Emmy, you feel free to jump in. You probably ought to sort of articulate this more, and I'm not a productivity expert, but the, you know, effectively we've basically seen sort of flatlining or reversing productivity in recent years. Um, there's kind of, uh, you know, the productivity argument I think has often been won by the conservatives because they effectively say if we want a more product, productive economy, just just completely deregulate the labour market. Yeah. And then we'll have we'll have more output for less input in in labour, and bang, there we s- suddenly solved um, uh, productivity uh, generally. I think uh, I want to see a kind of more front foot, uh, progressive idea of building a productive economy, and that means looking at ways to facilitate change and investment in new technology and innovation and all of this sort of stuff in a way that sort of brings people, uh, you know, along like. If in theory you suddenly Uberize the entire economy and you had every single person working on gig contracts, it, technically our productivity numbers would be higher because you'd be paying like just the equation of productivity, like you know, um, labor cost v output would be improved and the numbers would look better. But wouldn't that just be a terrible outcome for every single person? So we need to figure out a way to kind of uh, be on the front foot with a more progressive, more worker friendly vision of what a productive economy looks like and that's there's a huge amount of stuff to do that we're you know talking about future economy stuff um you know the rise of ai and all this sort of uh, tra- uh, technological transformation in the economy is, is you know when it means we need to rethink things like redundancy and uh you know worker protections generally and transitions between jobs and all that sort of stuff so um, and that needs to be framed in a way of like enabling and in- encouraging a product- productive economy. So I think, I, I just think that the conservative criticism or, uh, uh, you know, if you read any AFR column, like the big asterisk on the economy is always productivity. And I, I think there's still territory there to demonstrate that that's being addressed. Yeah. I think- Emma, I'm keen on your thoughts because you're grinning away there as, uh, <laughs> as talking yeah, about that. Tell- I'll be quick. Um, I think, yes, productivity is a challenge, but it's not, it's the decline or the flatlining of productivity has a has a culprit and it is not the workforce. Um, Labor productivity is pretty good in this country, always has been. Um, it's business investment that's been missing. Uh, and if you look at Australia is no different than um, other English-speaking developed countries in recent years. When business has made profit, it has ploughed that profit back into itself. It has been engaged in share buybacks or executive bonuses, it has not invested in uh, product productivity enhancing um, technologies or new ways of working. That's a bigger problem in Australia than it is in more complex economies because we have such a, you know, a relatively small pool of big earning industries. So when those industries don't invest um, and there's such a huge proportion of our economy, then our productivity drops very quickly. Um, so, for example, a lot of the productivity gains in mining have been gained. You know, there's not a lot more we can do um, to automate mining. They're not big employers anymore. They use technology um, to drive their profits, but they're not reinvesting those back into people. Another part of the challenge is the fastest growing area of our economy is services. Something like 65, 75% of us now work in services, and they're notoriously difficult to measure in terms of our traditional productivity measures. Um, so my view is a little different to the productivity commissions. I don't think that that it's the lack of productivity of services that's bringing our measurement of productivity down. I think it's that we don't measure the productivity of services adequately. So the way you traditionally do is how many hours of a, of a worker's time does it take to make a widget? Um, and then the more widgets you can make in an hour, the more productive you are. Services don't work like that. Um, so, you know, a great example is the previous chair of the Productivity Commission came out a couple of years ago, maybe not even that long ago, and said there have been no productivity gains in the early childhood education and care sector for 20 years, completely ignoring 
the rise in women's workforce participation that would not be possible without the early childhood education and care sector. So we look at productivity in a very siloed way. And in services, we actually need to take a much more um, holistic, integrated look at the way those services enhance our lives because the guy that's going to make the widgets in the factory can't do that if there's no one feeding him or maintaining his home. We don't count that kind of work. So there's going to be a challenge as we move into the post-carbon economy where we will maintain having a high proportion of service uh, sector jobs how we not just enhance the productivity of those jobs. So people will talk about using machines in aged care, for example. That might not be the outcome that people want in personal care, um, but measuring that productivity more um, completely and how it contributes to our well-being as a nation. The other side of this, of course, is you'll get the same people saying we want to see productivity growth that will be poo-pooing the government's made in Australia approach because they don't think the government should do anything to intervene in the economy. But at the same time, they'll say the economy is more abundant, there's no productivity growth, business isn't investing, but they object to government doing anything that might give business the certainty to invest, like, you know, setting a carbon price or, um, you know, basic things like that. Uh, so there comes a point where you have to call these people out and say, well, you, you, you've been whinging about the economy for over a decade, but whenever anyone suggests doing something different, you say, oh, no, no, don't, don't interfere. Don't interfere in the economy. Don't interfere in the market. The market is not producing these outcomes that we need now, particularly with the challenge of decarbonising. So, yeah, um, intervention in the market needs to be made in a way, and I think the Treasurer has been pretty clear that it will be invested in a way that will enhance productivity and grow the pie, but also look at the distribution of that pie. Emma, can I um, pick up on some of your initial remarks in terms of where you want to see priorities? I think you were talking about this sort of restructuring of the the, the Australian economy, and you talked mm-hmm. about this sort of post-carbon world that we're moving to. Um I guess my question to you is um, if you were the treasurer going into this budget, knowing how close it is to the election, is this the time to start to introduce some of the things that you'd want to see in terms of restructuring the economy? Or is that something you just wait until let, let, let's win the next term and then right off the bat in that next election, sorry, in that next budget after you've been reelected to start to restructure it? And what, where would you begin um, with that kind of, you know, because I'm conscious of the. I want to ask you through the lens of moving to more renewables and, and all that kind of stuff. Because we're starting to see things happen, right? There's an attitude will change, I think, in the public. Um, now is the time, obviously, to really double down on it. But would you do it now, or would you wait till the next term? You start now, but you don't. You don't introduce big changes until the next. So, so my response to all of the community organisations that we work with, etc., is you're not going to see major tax reform in this budget. It is something that needs to be explained, have the community come along and then be delivered as part of a a legitimate agenda. Now, does that mean I think this government's going to be bold enough to take a 2019-style bill short and tax reform package to the next election? No, I don't think. I think they've learned that lesson too. Um, But I, I do think what this budget needs to do is soften the ground in a way, and that's what what's happening. You know, the the announcement around the future made in Australia been shot down because it's, you know, it's being framed in a very populist way. People like to hear that we're going to make things here. It's actually also the right thing to do. So it's getting the politics right as well as the policy. There's no way I would go into this budget if I were the Treasurer and say, oh, guess what, we're going to dump a whole heap of tax reform on your head without announcement and then we'll see how you like that in the in the next election. That's not how it's done. Um, what we do need to see, though, is the kind of and, and let, let, let's make a comparison here. Um, Albanese said he wants to be more like the Hawke government than any other. Um, Chalmers is being compared to Keating all the time. Of course, they held a big tax summit in 1985 um, that enabled them then to make some pretty significant changes to the economy. They didn't do that in their first term. You know, they 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 made that a kind of centrepiece of the of the middle of their of their administration. But if you look at who went to that tax summit and how successful it was, you'd be very hard pressed to put something like that on today and have the same buy-in across the economy because you'd instantly be shouted down, it's a stunt on the right or it's not enough on the left. It's harder today to do those things than it was 40 years ago. 
That doesn't mean you don't try. It means you have to do it in a much more cautious way, particularly given the high numbers on the crossbench that are, you know, almost certainly going to um, increase at the next election. So, no, no, I don't expect to see them come out and make big changes to taxes. They may do something on negative gearing perhaps to make it a supply issue. I hope they do, that, but I'm not holding my breath for that. But I actually do believe that changes to the taxation settings around housing need to be part of a bigger look at tax because negative gearing doesn't just apply to property investment, right? It applies to all kinds of investments. So does the capital gains tax discount. We've got a whole heap of taxation settings now that are contributing to what Ken Henry has called it a generational tragedy. And they are actually creating a society of haves and haves nots, have nots. So my view would be in this budget, you point to what's been done so far. This is a government that is seeking to bring people, you know, back up into into society that have been marginalised, um, that we have looked at all different sides of the economy. We're not acting recklessly in one regard, you know, it's just pumping money in over here without worrying about inflation over there. We are, as Ed said, the grown-ups. We're the ones that can be trusted. Um, but in order to build the kind of consensus that's needed for big economic reform and that was built in the 1980s, um, despite the opposition of the then you know, of the coalition at the time. They like to pretend it was all bipartisan. It wasn't. But they built a coalition in the community. In order to do that, you've got to proceed as cautiously as this government has been while flagging an intention to create a new economy that is going to serve people. And you'll notice I'm not using words like reform that much because people are sick of that. You want to talk about investment instead of spending, about creating opportunity instead of reforming the system. We focused the reason, as you said, that that the community attitude shifted, Stephen, towards action on climate change is because of a very deliberate move by the ALP over the last three to four years of talking about the opportunities rather than the threats, of talking about what challenges we can meet and what benefits they will bring rather than, oh, you're all going to lose your jobs and the planet's going to burn. So it's it's a framing exercise and this budget's really critical in setting off that framing. I want to come back to Ed in a minute, but I'm not going to ask this question of Ed because it would be unfair since he's across the border. But just as a counter-argument to that um, consensus, how much consensus do you think the Andrews government did over the time that they were in? that he was running this show and their economic agenda. Like I don't get a sense that there was much of that. They were they had an idea and they just went and did it. Yep. Why, what do you think about that as an idea for the Albanese government just going, well, you know what, we've got elected and we're going to use this time wisely. Let's get, let's get it's cracking. Harder. It's harder federally for a start. Um, so if, Why? Well, for a start, states yep. are split. Sorry? So I, was, so I was just going to jump in. I mean, Labor dominate in in. Victoria and they don't federally. They're inherently yeah. much more vulnerable. So it's so it's harder to be that so yeah. to have that degree of bang, here we go, like crash through, we'll yeah. be fine anyway. Labor yeah, had, I mean, Labor just, had government you, in Victoria you, in twenty fourteen by three seats. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. You're right, Stephen. But the point I want to make is state governments are elected for service delivery, right? So when you say I'm gonna do this because it's what people want, they'll give you a lot more f- slack to do that because they are electing you to deliver things. The federal government is seen as basically managing the economy and then providing the money for states to deliver things. And so there's this kind of Australian voters are pretty clever, right? They go, well, maintain the the economy really safely up here, keep all the money and then the states can do what they want. There's There's an element of that, that states get away with being bolder because people want them to do things. When the federal government says we're going to do things, People get worried about that because they see it wrongly, in my view, as interfering in the market. There's also, as Ed pointed to, Victoria is a very progressive state. We've got a smaller land mass. We're much more culturally, um, you know, homogenous, not in terms of ethnicity, but in terms of our, you know, view of of the role of government, etc. Um, you only have to look at how Victoria compared in referendum votes over the last few de- years to Queensland or WA to see the difference. Um, But you also have, you don't have, um, you know, we do have the Herald Sun in Victoria, we do have commercial radio, but they're not nearly as rabid, Herald Sun may be an exception, but Hmm. radio is not nearly as rabid as in other parts of the country. You know, our our version of a shock jock has, has, well, now it's it's Tom Elliott down here, you know, he's, he's actually fairly moderate for a right winger. So um, it is, but but having said that, yes, I share your frustration. I think 
the federal government could go harder on some things, but it's easy for us to say that from, you know, the People's Republic of Melbourne, isn't it? It's, you know, it's, um, we're, we're, we're in a part of the world. Done. And also, you know, we, we've got a year until the election and they need to, they want to bring people along for that, for that journey. You know, yeah. we say if they're going to do more on, you know, super profits tax or on negative gearing or something like that, um, you need to, you need to dominate the argument and make like, kind of like what they've done with the stage three, they've kind of made it watertight and made arguing against the changes that they made kind of seem a bit, a bit silly. And you can't just, you can't just um, thrust that upon people without, uh, I think, a, a serious campaign to bring bring people along for the journey. Um, one of the big, uh, you know, I'm a big fan of his, and I'm sure we, we all are, but Andrew Lee has been, an inc- uh, has been such an effective minister in that they're actually doing some really interesting reforms and he's doing all this work on non-compete clauses at the moment. Mm-hmm. And their whole, their whole approach is, you know, they're changing some pretty significant things but really genuinely cons- doing it in a consultative way, bringing people along making it kind of seem like a logical place to end up instead of just just doing it you know without uh, without ensuring that those those bases are covered so I think on <laughs> if we saw any more ambition on on uh, you know big tax reform stuff then it's going to be part of a a pretty concerted obvious process um, and not necessarily just thrust upon <laughs> upon us in a budget but my question is then and this is more moving to the sort of the realm of political communication i know that we talk about uh you know sydney radio and brisbane radio shock jocks and all that kind of stuff i think they're just as rabid in victoria i think the difference is that they're manipulated better by this they were manipulated better by the state government and i think they kind of got in their heads you know former premier andrews never went on steve price he never went on who was the other bloke neil mitchell <laughs> i forgot his name um, Elbo likes going on to those shows. He goes on Ben Ford. I don't know why he goes on Ben Ford to talk about the voice. Because if you, you don't know, go I don't on know. Ben Ford in Sydney, you're not talking to half the you know half the audience. It's it's it is. Different. I don't think and people listen to Ben Fordham. Like oh, all the evidence that we're seeing is that people are getting their media from a far more fragmented way than they were ten years ago. And I just don't think that talkback radio has any impact on the well, voters that we need to, need to go after. I think a bunch of Tories are listening to Ben Fordham and they're getting what they want. We've all gone into our little silos, but I think yeah, that there I, are other ways I think in which we can communicate. You're making a good point. I think that actually a lot of this fear is um, is a hangover from the experience of the last federal government to some extent, you know. Um, yeah. I don't think it's it's just because Dan didn't go on Neil Mitchell that they don't have much play in Victoria. I mean, shock shocks have never been particularly successful in Victoria right through my adult life. But, yes, I mean, you, you asked us why they, why they don't do it. This is why. There's a fear and, you know, there's a big caucus up there. There's 77... Um, in the lower house and a bunch of senators and amongst them all there's there are people that are still genuinely scarred by the Rudd Gillard years and genuinely terrified of the power of the Murdoch and the tabloid press. I think like you they're they're rot they're they're not keeping up with the changes enough. So if you look at young people in particular, why are we losing all these votes to the Greens? Because they don't give a damn what's written in the media. You know, when the Greens housing policy came out, I was asked to write an analysis of it for the nine papers and I couldn't find much good to say about it at all based on a pure policy analysis. I tried to put my partisanship aside because I want to see um, a non-market developer in the public, you know, building social housing. But that didn't cut through to the green support base because they don't read the nine papers. They're on TikTok and, you know, they're on um, international media sites where they hear about, you know, wiping student debt being a big, big issue for gener- for millennials. Well, it is in America. It's not as big an issue here as it's been portrayed. Um, so, yes, you're right. They, they are more afraid than they need to be. But when you've got a majority of two and you've got to balance the needs of people in Brunswick with the demands of people in Kalgoorlie, um, you have to tread a slightly different line. I would like to see a bit more of the old fighting Tories elbow uh, along the Dan Andrews line as well. And I think, you know, we'll, we see flashes of that occasionally and it's a good thing. It's still there. But the national media is a is a difficult, difficult beast still, um, and they're still also at the at the traditional media level. Many, many journalists that are senior in the Nine Papers, in the ABC, even in Guardian Australia, um, who still operate in that paradigm where you know what's on the front page of the Oz is going to dictate the political agenda for the day. It's breaking down, but it's going to take time, and and that kind of 
PTSD that a lot of the current cabinet have from the Rudd Gillard years. Man, I still got a bit myself, and I was just a lowly staffer, so I can only imagine hmm. how they. In the words of Frank Hu- uh, Herbert, fear is the mind killer. That's what I always think. So you know, just just get into them. Uh, final thoughts before we wrap up, and obviously we'll talk to you two wonderful people in a week's time. Starting with you, Ed. What are your final reflections before we head into this budget? Look, I'm interested in what we're going to see rolled out over the next week. Um, we've there's a couple of announcements we talked about hex, uh, the hex changes, the prac payments. Th- they kind of really reflect the the kind of uh, practical yet not incredibly expensive ways of of kind of uh, appeasing the moment a little bit while doing some productive, important things. I'm I'm just curious, really, what we're going to see over the next um, week or so. Um, but other than that, let's just see what happens. I'm looking forward to talking about it. Uh, what the day after this budget? I'll have to wrap my head around the papers pretty quick. Yeah, we I, I hope we've given you enough time because I'm assuming you're both <laughs> going to be in the lock lock up room. Is that what they call it? I, I'm not actually. But oh wow! Yeah, but I'll uh, I'll I'll be you know control effing on the. Yeah. Um, <laughs> good. Well, good. Margaret, Margaret McKenzie's going in for per capita. When you've got Margaret McKenzie on your team, you don't try and do the budget budget lock up yourself. You defer to the expertise. She's been doing it nice for. One. So, uh, but yeah, we'll be we'll be prepared for the next one. But yeah, my my concluding thoughts: I am thrilled with today's announcement on paid placements, play, paid placements for students, and that that includes social work students. I was up in Canberra in March with the ASU and the students to end placement poverty to do a big push on that. So really pleased with that. I think the hex changes are sensible. Um, I also want to give a shout out to the. Uh, announcement a couple of weeks ago from Katie Gallagher that we will see um, superannuation mm. on paid parental leave, something that we have been, we worked with the late, great Linda White on that issue when she was at the ASU back in 2017. So a fitting tribute to Linda there. Um, I, I, you know, they're, they're the early things that are released that are good news. There'll be more good news on the night. They always save up a couple of big announcements. Mm. So I look forward to what's there. But yeah, it is a scene setting budget. And I think, we, if we want to see a bit of that boldness, um, it's it's there. It's there in this approach to a future made in Australia, and to, and it's a big deal reclaiming the role of government in industry policy. Let's not ignore that just because Joe Biden's done it. Um, uh, you know, the, the the gnashing of teeth at the Oz and the AFR when that came out shows you what a big shift that is. Um, and so, yeah, I'm I'm as always, Stephen, optimistic. Couldn't do the job. No, Ed uh, Kavanagh and uh, Emma Dawson, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, Enjoy your budget evening. I'm sure it's kind of like the grand final for you guys. And I look forward to talking to you next week as we sort of unpack what is uh, in the third budget for this Labor government. Looking forward to it. Yeah, thanks. Hey there. Thanks for listening to Social Democratic. Did you like the podcast? Hit the follow or subscribe button and be sure to leave a review on Apple Podcasts or Podchaser. And to get all the latest updates on Socially Democratic, follow Dunn Street on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter and LinkedIn. And we'll see you next Friday.